Hello again everyone, welcome back to yet another video about Metagoon strategies and planning. Like any other mid-game studies in YouTube, it's going to be difficult to learn anything if we don't pause for a bit to look at the position and try to solve it on our own. And so I'm just going to try to make this video as interactive as possible and try to let you pause every now and then. Now, today's theme is about opening lines and it's essentially learning to sack a pawn or two, a piece or two to open up a brand new lines for your pieces to start attacking. One of the most useful topics to get into in chess especially if you always feel stuck in the middle game and about your plan in general on what to do the next few moves. We will take a quick look of the example between James Serwin and Bobby Fischer. Bobby at the time was a young international master squaring it up against some of the strongest grandmaster in the USA. And in this position, Bobby plays bishop to d7, a move to initiate a trade-off because the bishop is rather passive. For a bishop of your opponents that is rather active, this is considered a good trade. But again, James is probably not stupid, right? He plays bishop to c2. He does not want to trade, keeping the position close, keeping the possibilities there will be attack on the king's side, and so that's why he's preserving as many pieces as possible, and just try to wait, right? But again, this is where you should pause the video to really consider the plan for black if he does want to make a breakthrough. Again, the context here is that you're playing against a stronger opponent, and so yes, they might run you down if you don't come out with a good plan and only keep playing a waiting move. Try to pause the video, try to figure out the plan, I'll give you a couple of seconds. Now Bobby Fischer plays pawn to a5. This move is probably nothing special, right? He's just pushing his pawn on the queen's side, trying to gain space on the queen's side. But that's not really the point. After pawn to c5 by James Serwin, Bobby continues to run the pawn down the board. And even after pawn to c6 attacking the bishop, Bobby doesn't care and plays pawn to b3, counter-attacking the bishop on c2. The idea is if it has to come down to this position, where both sides make a trade like this, now black has an open b-file that he can use to actually target the white king right here, for example. A simple move like rook to b8, queen to d7, and then try to double up the rook here on the b-file is something that black is looking to do. And so you see, this is really what it means by sacrificing a piece or a pawn really to change the structure and open up more lines and more possibilities for your pieces to attack your opponent's king. And obviously, if you play bishop to b1, there's a similar thing of opening the b-file, letting the rook to actually infiltrate. Of course, you have to free up the bishop first, bishop to e8 or c8, probably e8 is better, heading to g6, slicing up against this diagonal. So all in all, all changes of structure actually favors black in this position because he's the one who is creating initiative, sacrificing some of the pawns to actually open up more lines to generate an attack like this. Oftentimes, in a position where you're slightly better, a pawn can be a really troublesome thing to actually deal with because it really can hinder some of the movement from your pieces. But exactly by sacrificing a pawn like this, one can really get rid of the pawns and start to get out of the business. Now James continue with pawn takes b3 and after recapture twice on the square on b3, Bobby doesn't even care but the bishop plays queen to b8, attacking the bishop here on b3, counter-attacking. Now there's several ways to defend this bishop, but even then, white still have to choose from the correct one or else he will just fall into demise pretty quickly. For example, bishop to c2 over here is not a correct move because it allows rook to a1 pretty quickly. Coming in with check, and after bishop to b1, let's say we can free up the bishop, going to e8 for example, and then to g6, just as we discussed earlier. Well, you say, how about king to c2? Well, of course, bishop to c8, freeing up the bishop for a bit. Obviously, bishop to e8 is also good, but his bishop on c8 is really trying to attack the queen um, that is sitting on e2 in the light squares right here. All in all, nothing good for white in the apparent moment. James continued with queen to c4, and after bishop to e8, I still prefer bishop to c8, just because it provides a possibility to attack the queen right here. Obviously, we can also bring our rook here to a5 first, before playing bishop to a6, rook to a5, the idea of doubling up on the b-file to attack is also pretty good. In general, the idea will be pretty easy to follow. But anyway, Bobby Fischer is a better player than I am. Plays bishop to e8, idea is to bring it to g6. Excuse me, g6 is this square. Where he just want to play pawn to f4 and release the bishop on this long diagonal over here. Pretty good plan as well. And so James is just trying to hold on, right? Plays pawn to h4. This move does nothing in this position apparently. I mean, it's proven at the pawn to f4, bishop to f2, bishop to g6. Yeah, he can place h5, but then bishop to f5, h6, bishop to f6. These two bishops are still controlling the long diagonal where the king is residing in, and so probably it spells nothing good anyway. Nothing good for white in this position. And look at this rook, by the way. Horrible rook sitting on the h-file. He wants to do a rook lift, and the only square he can do that is on h5 right here, but as soon as he moves to h5, there is bishop to g6, has to be kicked away to h1. So you see, this is another point in which you can also make your pieces more active, but also shutting down your opponent's pieces like this. And all in all, it is in the cost of one pawn. It should be very, very sexy to do things like this. 
to your opponent, of course. One disposition continues with king to d2, only escape plan that makes sense. Idea is to bring the rook to a1 and try to see if we can challenge the rook to be traded. The rook to a5, rook to a1, we do see rook to b5. Again, just trying to double up on the b file that is pretty open right now. The trap also is to net a blunder. Let's say if James plays rook to a3, there is rook to b4 in this position, kicking the queen out. The only square to keep contact with the bishop is c3 and c2. But after the queen to c3, pawn to e4. After queen c2, of course, you get captured by the bishop here on f5. But I guess in this position, Bobby Fischer missed the move bishop to a7. So that's why I prefer the move bishop to c8 and bishop to a6, where it really tries to hit the queen as soon as possible and try to create threats of the threat. It just feels easier that way. I don't know which one is better though. I don't really trust the engine bars that is always going up and down each different time I look at them. So yeah, maybe if you have a different setup, you can check it out on your own. In any case, I still think that the bishop c8 move is slightly better in my opinion because it just has an easier flow to play. But okay, let's just say bishop to a7 is something that is missed by Bobby Fischer. He settles down for two minor pieces for a queen. But even in this position, you'll still see that he has full control of the b-file. The king is cornered to the first rank over here. The bishop here is controlling most of the diagonal. And the only piece for one that is out of the first rank is the queen right here on c4. This rook and h1 and a1 not playing a role apparently. Because let's say anytime they move to b4, a4, whatever 4, there is rook to b1 check. And following that is a mate with rook to b2. Say after king to c3, there is rook to c2 mate. So in the current moment, what really needs to prove the material advantage that he has here is something that is useful. And it's not easy. Rook to d1 played by James and after bishop to h4. This is really a peculiar move played by Bobby. I don't like this move at all. Something of rook to b4 would have been a much better move, attacking the queen directly. After queen to a6, let's say, there is rook to c2 after all, this kind of plan would be good. After queen to c3, there is still, I don't know, rook to b3 would be good as well. There is obviously rook 2 to b3. You do not want to play rook 4 to b3 because after queen takes, rook takes, um, you see this kind of position is really not good for black. Black does not have enough material and the rook is constantly very active. Don't want to do that. In any case, not played by Bobby Fischer. Instead, played a peculiar move, a set of peculiar moves, I should say, that allows this rook to be active in the second rank and the queen to be active in the sixth rank. Going to the eight is a possibility from now on. King to d2 to try to escape is possible. So I'm not sure what Bobby did, but it makes winning a lot more difficult than it seems. After king to d2, rook to d5, king to e2, the king escaping. Suddenly, the inactive pieces that we discussed about earlier is trying to do something right here and after the trade. You know, we're not going to go too much in depth in this position because Bobby Fischer does not have enough. He resigned the game. But the loss is not what is important, right? Because it's technically opened up the position and Grant himself an easy play up from the middle game to the end game while the opponent is just trying to suffer, trying to defend. And so this is really chess in a top level and even intermediate level now. The key is always trying to create problems for your opponent rather than sitting passively, come up with a plan and try to get you. You want to be the one pressing the balloon until it explodes, not the other way around. Well, then you might say, yeah, it's easy, you know? You just push pawns and then try to open lines and try to win games. Well, yes, that is partly true, but you still have to understand which pawn to push and you have to assess if you have the correct reinforcement for your sacrifice. That said, let's move on to the second game. Again, you can pause the video right here to see what is the best one for white. The theme in this position is that black is down two rooks. Well, akin to being down two rooks anyway because it's, you know, it's stuck in a corner. They worth nothing currently. The queen side is locked. And the other thing that White has in this position is that he has an immense pressure on d-file in which if d-file is open, black is probably going to be kaput. And so I'll give you a couple of seconds. You can try to pause the video and see where you can come out with it. And also the general plan to actually clear black in this position. The move right here is pawn to c4. This is interesting not only because it tries to tear up the d-file and try to get the rook in, but the continuation is really not simple, right? But I suppose everyone spot this kind of move. And the idea is after knight to b4, we see rook to b3, and we lose the b7 pawn, so this is a no-no for black. But even if d takes c4, this just looks like a stupid move to play for white, because okay, you have rook to d7, but then what? It's really difficult to find a plan right here for white. And the idea is very simple. I remember I didn't really understand this puzzle at all when I was working on it and was almost crying looking at this. So I turned on the engine and the idea is pretty much beautiful. After let's say king to g7, which is the only making sense move to get this rook out. Idea is we don't stop sacrificing. We sacrifice again with knight takes on c6. It comes to check and king to h6 would have seemed like a blunder because knight to f7 is another check. Um, you don't want to walk into this. 
And so pawn takes e6, but then after knight to e6, wherever a king goes, I have pawn to f5, opening up the lines for the queen to get in. For example, king h7, I have pawn to f5. Idea is pawn takes, queen takes, knight is pin, cannot take. And say he doesn't, let's say he plays something like queen to e8, then I have pawn to f6. You know, the knight can't move, he'll be lost. And let's say he plays rook to f8, the only move that seems like defending the knight indirectly. We can slow play this by playing queen to e3, queen to f4, queen to g5. Try to snoop in that way, after that with knight to f4, attacking the g6 square. You can also play knight to g5 in this position, see what it does later on. Tons of options. So in a game, of course, black does not take, he plays king to g7, which makes things a little bit more confusing, right? And makes the move pawn to c4 look like a blunder, and a move that a kid would play in a desperate situation. But Grig Grig, right, is a world champion caliber, and he really is. He plays pawn takes on d5. Ideas after knight takes d5, you're no longer controlling the f5 square, so I break in with f5. Again, this might seem stupid, because after g takes f5, you might lose two pawns. They might seem like nothing in this position, but rook takes d5. So you keep sacrificing after pawn takes on d5, you say pawn to e6. Idea is, after f takes e6, the knight check comes again. After king to f6, we see rook to d5. Even after knight to e7 in this position, we're infiltrating in this position pretty nicely. Example, queen to d4 and rook to d6 is just a fine move. And threatens to make another discovery for black later on. And if f6 is played, trying to survive in this condition, one has knight to f7 attacking the rook. The rook can run, but then queen g3 and queen to d6, something like this. In essence, just trying to get all these pieces inside. The opponent's territory is the best choice right here. And try to suffocate black. In fact, next turn after queen to g3, that is officially a mate, checkmate. And I believe I don't really need to continue this position to say that black is kaput over here. The game continues with knight to d7, but the same thing can occur after queen to g3. Let's say king to h7, let's say we can play queen to d6. This would be good. Knight to d7 is on tap as well. All in all, this position is kaput. And in this position, after he lost few more pawns and few more materials, Daniel playing black in this position resigned. Surely enough, the pawn cannot be stopped. And yeah, he found no meaning in this level to keep on playing. He just threw in the towel. But does really show you a different contrast from the first game. Where he just sacrificed one pawn. Blade Greek sacrifices few pieces. And due to his understanding of his own reinforcement and his own forces, he's able to create a devastating attack that leads to a checkmate like this. And so I should say the concept of opening lines is really difficult ones to study because you're literally sacrificing pieces and using the one available to create an investigating checkmate. But of course, you can be most certain you can sacrifice pieces when your opponent has stuck pieces like this as we discussed in the first few minutes of this puzzle. The last game in this position takes a modern example between Sergei Karyakin and Lok Van Welie. Even then, Sergei Karyakin in this position, excuse me, in this game was probably very young and Lok Van Welie is the strongest player in the Dutch just before Anishigiri was on the rise. And so let us see how this young Sergei Karyakin can actually topple down one of the strongest players in the world at the time. Now I must first say the position of the knight on the rim is pretty much dim. The bishop here is kind of trapped on the first rank. Even then he can develop on the second rank, it's not doing much. One has a stronghold on d5, controlling the important square of e6 and c6. And so probably you'll see that white is a bit better, right? But there's no concrete way to create an attack on black's pieces or camp or the king. That is until he plays queen to h5 in this position after black plays bishop to e7. I still don't like the move bishop to e7 though because it's not really, you know, connecting the rooks. Now I can pause the video here to see what Karyakin did and I'll give you a couple of seconds. Now no matter what black does in this position, in the game he plays rook to f8, but literally no matter what, what black does, Karyakin plays knight to a5 and after queen to a5 plays bishop to h6, sacrificing a piece. And I should say this as well, if you don't take the pawn, you just down a pawn, and you'll probably cry while defending. But after taking, there's the same thing as death, because after queen to g6, that comes with check, king h8, queen to h6, there is also check. And so suddenly, Karyakin has guaranteed a draw, but in this position, there are more than a draw. For example, rook to e3 in this position, coming to g3, and trying to checkmate black down the g-file. Black might think, okay, I have pawn to f4, but never did he thought, that is rook takes e5 from Karyakin in this position. The idea is after pawn takes on e5, we see queen takes 6 check. After he moves to light squares, we play pawn to d6. Now look at who is going to come up to join the forces as soon as possible. You wouldn't think that a bishop here has a chance to play, but this super grandmaster knows how to surprise us. After rook to f7, trying to protect the only light squares that is open right now, bishop to c4 anyway. 
because after bishop to d8, we can play bishop to c4. Even after rook to f7 right here, we can see a very quick checkmate. Black tries to prolong the game, of course, with rook to f7, try to prevent the checkmate first. But then we come in anyway, the bishop to f5, holding out this diagonal. Quite useless though, because we then take on e7. And in this position, Lok van Wely, the strongest Dutch player, resigned. Now obviously he resigned despite being up a piece, because of course this rook is going to be lost. This queen is offset. He can play queen to g5 check and pick up the bishop just because the rook is pinned. For example, black can hold on with rook to e8, but then queen to g5 check and picking up the bishop is a good and simple enough plan to win the game. And so yeah, that is basically the essence of opening lines to create a counter play for your pieces, is that you have to be ready to sacrifice a pawn sometime, sometimes two to three pawns, and even a piece or two pieces as we've shown in the last game, to basically create a devastating attack that your opponent will have difficulty of handling. And as usual, if you like this video, please leave a thumbs up. That will be fully appreciated. You can also interact with me via Instagram, Twitter or email to see if you've got similar experiences sacrificing pieces to get a deadly attack on your opponent. Otherwise, thanks for watching. See you soon.